Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. More often than not, you'll find us in conversations with people, and this uh, last uh, two weeks, I think I've been in more conversations around one topic than most any other time during the year, and it's not too unusual because this is the time of the year that the Supreme Court will often give a lot of their uh, their decisions down to the people, and of course, those who know Christ as Savior or have chosen to live for the Lord or have a real desire to know what God has to say, they're always anxious and anticipating uh, what will our country be like and what kind of um, decision will the Supreme Court uh, put upon all of us, including Christians. And those of you that are living here in our country and you've been here this last couple of weeks, you've known that we've been anticipating the decision coming down from the Supreme Court, particularly how they would want us to view uh, same-sex marriage to the point of legalizing uh, certain aspects of the same-sex marriage concept uh, federally all throughout the country. And I guess more of the conversations I've had with people would be anywhere from what in the world is happening and what should we do now to I wish there was another island I could go to that has nobody there and we could start Christianity all over again. I mean, it was so bizarre. Others are wanting to know, should we maybe uh, get up arms and how far can we go to fight what we're hearing coming down from the Supreme Court? And I can understand your angst because I also am wrapped in flesh and when I hear things that are put upon us that are Uh, really against God and His Word, it causes me angst and I begin to question how should I respond to this and so I don't react to it. And of course, the best place to go for us to find what God would want us to do and how we should think about this is going to be found in His Word. And you and I that know Christ as Savior, and this message today is mostly directed to us that know Christ as Savior, we know that the Lord is in heaven. He is not wringing His hands. He also knows what is happening here in America as He is as far away as in Africa and Timbuktu. God knows everything. All of it is according to His permission and His prescription. All of it is to bring about His glory now and forevermore. So He is up in heaven orchestrating that which He wants to permit. And although even in sin and the wickedness of man can also praise God, maybe not during the actual sin, of course, but thereafter. So I wanted to leave you today with perhaps how you not only could respond to what's going on, but maybe how you can attitudinally adjust to it in your spirit so that we don't make decisions based upon our feeling, but we make our decisions and live our lives according to God's word. So I've titled this message today, The Foundations of Our Freedom. But I'd like to take you back to Scripture, and I want to go through an exposition of Psalm 11 before I go through the main points of the message today, because I wanted to set our our face in the direction of the Lord. So I hope you have your Bibles with you, because you'll want to mark some of the phrases in this and also draw some lines from one verse to the other so you have a better understanding of it. So if you will, turn to Psalm 11, and we will go through verses 1 through the rest of the chapter, Psalm 11, 1 through 11. So if you will, open up your Bibles there. And let's uh, see what this has to say. I believe there's some great understanding in here that'll be for all of us. So let's begin at verse 1. It says, In the Lord I take refuge. Now before I go any further, it's important for us to know who is this I in here, in the Lord I take refuge. It's important for us to know that it was David. Now you young kids, you know David perhaps as that little shepherd boy that took care of sheep and grew up a little bit and he took down Goliath with his great faith and a, and a stone and all of that. And others of you that have followed the life of David, you might know that he was a great, not only warrior, but a great, we might call politician, Israel's greatest king. And you might even go far enough to say that he is the model for Christ. And we see how that Christ and David are often used together, although David is not Christ. So you'll know a lot about David. But what is so important about this passage is that It was given to David by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so David is now prompted by this supernatural force to write something down that would be preserved in accuracy for others to read. And now because I guess being a shepherd, I know that he he gave this to you and me right now, perhaps for this special time. So here is David who he himself dealt with a lot of challenges that came against him whether it was political because of Saul, the first king, whether it was with his own family and dysfunction there, whether it was opposing forces to God, 
He knew a lot what it meant to have people come against him and his belief system. And here's what he writes now, again. In the Lord I take refuge. Notice there's no in the Lord plus something or in the Lord instead of something. He says, in the Lord I take refuge. In a few moments, I'm going to answer the question, how do you take refuge in the Lord? Because when you hear that, does that mean you crawl up into his lap? Do you get underneath his toga? How do you crawl into the Lord and have this refuge in God? Is it an existential attitude that we have? How do we have this refuge in the Lord? You'll see in just a moment. Let's now continue in the passage. So now he says, I take refuge in the Lord. And he's going to respond in a moment here to another voice. It could be his critics or it could be counselors that are coming against him with some thoughts. Maybe the same with you and me. How many people are really well-minded in your life, but they're biased and they'll give you their opinion on how our country should be and how you should live your life even as a Christian. And so now he responds to that and he says, how can you say to my soul? And that word soul is, how can you speak to my emotions? How can you speak to my inner being? How can you say these things to me? And now he quotes and he says, here's what you're saying to me. Flee as a bird to your mountain. And that's because the bird is so fragile and the mountain is so strong. So it's like people telling you or maybe your own emotions saying, I need to flee and go to another place because I feel like all hell is raining down on me because everything that's happening that I believe so dearly in seems to be taken away from me. So how can you say to my soul, run or fly like a bird for comfort? Verse 2, for behold, the wicked bend their bow. That's why you'd want to flee, his critics are saying. The wicked are bending their bow. And that's an interesting word. It doesn't just say bend. It's bending. It's a continual action. It seems like almost any time you open up the newspaper, there's going to be either something in the entertainment field or people's opinions or blogs or radio announcers or radio personalities or court systems that they seem to be aiming their arrows against those of us who have a particular value system based upon God's word. So they bend their bow. That means they're getting ready. And they're going to shoot their arrow. And then it says, to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. So let me just assume for a moment that you are one of those who are upright in heart. That would be someone who has trusted Christ as their personal Savior. It is that one now who chooses to really live for the Lord from the inside out. It's not merely talking about those who want to just do good things. The upright in heart has to have a heart that's upright according to God's standards. And it begins with a personal relationship with Him. But the phrase when it says they shoot in darkness at the upright and heart, it seems to me that they shoot quite publicly. You can turn on any radio, open up any newspaper, pick up any magazine, go on the internet. And it seems like, as one commentator said most recently, it seems like there is an all-out assault on Christianity today. And he's very adamant about that. And it might be the case. But when it says in darkness, it means that a lot of these things are being plotted behind closed doors. It's done with a scheme, that there may be a strategy in there. Now, some of you are going to be writing me an email and saying, Ooh, Stan, are you a part of that conspiracy movement? Well, I don't know that I'm a part of the conspiracy movement, and I want to be careful of that. On the other hand, I do believe it is in darkness, and there is a degree of a conspiracy going on. The unique thing is, is nothing is in darkness with God. Do you agree with that? So while it might be with man, God can see everything from the end to the beginning, from the, from the beginning to the end. He then says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now remember, those are the critics coming against David, trying to bring him down emotionally, shooting at him these, these comments. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So now some of you might be asking, what would the word foundations refer to? I believe in context, it's not difficult. I believe the word foundation is going to really refer back to God's word. But if you want to then take God's word, if you go to the Old Testament and the law, you're going to find that a lot of the law dealt with our relationship upward with God. We get all of that, the way you sacrifice, when you sacrifice, who sacrifices, what you sacrifice, all of that. But there were also a lot of laws that dealt with how to deal with people in your family, how to deal with people that are your neighbors, how do you deal with your enemies. There's a great deal of right and wrong. There's a moral value thing that's going on. And all of that is found in God's Word. So we will say the foundation is God's Word, but as it's lived out in society of people who love the Lord. So go back to that. If those foundations are destroyed, then what can the righteous do? And so the critics are basically saying, what are we going to do? If the foundations that we believed in for so long are being taken away from us, those truths, those values that we've had are no longer here, what are we going to do? The Hebrew actually says, what are we going to accomplish when all of these things are going to happen? 
Well, I will give you some things that we can do. I don't know that um, that means it will restore our foundations again, but it will mean that for me and my house, we do have a foundation, and that foundation will never be shaken. And if we all do that together, you can imagine how strong our foundations will be. Now, again, what can we really accomplish when this happens? There are things that we can do. But the first thing we need to do is do a little bit about what we heard in the song that was sung before I spoke. And that was the song about in his presence. I don't know about you, but knowing that I was going to preach this message, when that song was sung by Penny a few moments ago, there was a calming over my spirit because I know that I'm dealing in a satanic area right here because I'm really going to be hitting Satan right where it hurts the most because it's going to be God versus Satan, a biblical worldview versus a secular worldview, which we all know is driven by Satan. Now, that being the case, that song, In His Presence, that reminded me about what we're going to read now because really as we get prepared to stabilize the foundation of our own home and our own family unit and society within our own family, it's only in His presence that we'll be able to handle it with the peace and the joy that the Lord wants us to have even though politically, maybe even in some cases legally, all hell is breaking loose against us. So here's how he responds. He says, here's your question to me. We went through that to verse 3, now verse 4. What can the righteous do? Now he reminds him in verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. If you want to, you can pause there. We talk about the temple, which means that, again, it's personifying his righteousness, that spiritual dynamic that deals with eternity in a person's relationship with him because the temple would then kind of explain what was going on in the Old Testament. I don't have time to unpack that. But then it talked about his throne. His throne now dealt with the fact that he's in heaven, which means he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, which also would mean he is the judge of all judges. Do you agree with that? So no matter what earthly judge might get wherever he got, God allowed that person to get there, but ultimately the final judge is going to be the Lord himself. And although it says that his uh, temple and his throne is in heaven, it doesn't say that he is blind to what's going on in our own world. It goes on to say in verse 4, it says, His eyes behold... His eyelids test the sons of men. Now, it took me a while to figure out why does it say eyes and why does it say eyelids and all of that. And although I like to really look at Scripture as literal, we are in what we call the poetical books, not the rhetorical books, but the poetical books. So with the poetry, is still a degree of literalness. So here's how I would like to explain that. That means that even though he is in heaven, he rules over the whole world and all eternity, his eyes sees everything. He never sleeps or slumbers, Scripture says, so he is always awake. He is always alert. So perhaps when we see the word eyelids there, it's not a whole lot different than eyes, but the eyelids also talks about a greater focus. And he wants us to know that even the Lord sees everything, he also knows those fine details of what we might be going through at that moment. Now, those of you who are guests don't know this very much, probably probably at all, But our folks know the last number of years I've been dealing with double vision. I had multiple surgery and all of that. And I keep being asked, how are you doing? It's better. But I still have to wear glasses to read and and all of that. I can still drive. At least Carol lets me drive anyway. So if I'm in the parking lot, get out of my way. But um, the point of the matter is, though, when I want to see something very clearly and I don't have my glasses, I don't think I'm unlike many of you. What do you do? I kind of squint. Because I re- somehow when I squint, something happens with my eyes and I can see the paper. I could see the words a little more, more clearly. If that happens to you, can you say, uh-huh? All right, you're just like me. Well, in a sense, the eyes can see everything in from the beginning with the Lord and he sees all of us. But at the same time, his eyelids are looking right down on us. Not only us as Americans, but also us as people who live in the great state of Hawaii right here. He knows everything that's going on and how that's going to affect you and your children and your job and your money and your future and your freedoms right here. He has you totally in his mind and we are in his presence. So let's go a little bit further. So what is he doing? It says his eyes are looking, his his eyelids are testing us. Verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. So he's putting us all through the test to, to see if we're genuinely righteous. Righteous because God has given us his righteousness through Christ by faith alone. And now we're living out his righteousness by allowing him to live his life out through us. Or are we wicked people? either unsaved because we have not embraced his righteousness alone because we didn't think his was enough, so we have to try to do it ourselves, so that becomes wickedness, or we totally deny God, or we're a Christian who we are righteous in Christ, 
positionally, but practically we still carry on the deeds of the flesh. And he says, so he's testing us. And the one who he loves, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Now, for many years in the early part of my theology, I had a hard time struggling with, for God so loved the world. And here it says, his soul hates the wicked. And it didn't say he hates the wicked. It says his soul hates the wicked. One Hebrew scholar said it actually means he hates the wicked with all of his heart. Woo! That's kind of hard for me to understand. So without me getting too deep with all of this, I'm going to give you my simple answer. I do not know how he can love the world and hate the world at the same time. But at the same time, I have no fear in not knowing that and how God can do that. I do know that in God's hatred of the world, he still loves them enough to provide salvation by faith alone to the most wicked individual at any time as long as they would trust Christ as Savior. And that he loves them that much. At the same time, I would never know his love unless I knew his hatred for wickedness. And so I want to run quickly into his arms of love. So he does that to both. Well, let's go a little bit further. So I'm now reading this, and as I read this, I can understand that God is in the temple. He sees everything that's going on. Nothing past the Supreme Court without him knowing about it. He is now judging us, testing us, the rich, righteous and the wicked. We then will have to give an account of all of this, and God does have an attitude towards those that are righteous and towards those who do not have righteousness and are violent. Then verse 6 it says, Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire and brimstone, and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. All I have to do is get on any late night television show and say God will rain down these things on those people that will take a value system that's different from scripture and I will be laughed off the stage. If not, I'll be drug off the stage and totally lampooned for the rest of my life. All you have to do is be a politician who has Christian values and at one time say something that the world doesn't understand and that's all you'll ever hear about that one politician or government person. You understand what I'm saying. But it might be good for us to understand when it talks about the snares that are out there. Some of you are carrying a Bible that might say fire and brimstone, very much similar to what went on in Sodom and Gomorrah. So as I looked at this passage, I started realizing some big things were happening. And here's where I wanted you to draw your line. In verse 1, when it says here that David says, in the Lord I take refuge. How does he take refuge in the Lord? He takes refuge in the Lord, and now you draw a line to verse 4 when it says, the Lord is in his holy temple, which means that he is large and in charge, and that he's near and dear, and he knows everything that's going on. He will judge according to this, and he will judge a certain way. Now, when he uses fire and brimstone in these types of terms, here's what he's saying. He's saying, when it comes, it's going to rain on you, which means you will not be able to get away from this thing. Now, that's hard for us on the island to understand because when it rains here, up here in Nuuano, it may not be raining at the bottom of the poly. Do you all agree with me? And so it's hard for us that we can get out of the rain in just a matter of minutes. But in the Bible days, when it rained, it was a deluge. So when God decides to judge wickedness for their choices that are against Scripture, God says it will be raining and you will not get away from it. Then when you see the word fire and brimstone, it usually means it comes suddenly. Here we can know when a rain's going to come. I could look up the poly and I could see the cloud forming up on top. And I can watch as that wind is now going to blow it down on top of us here so we can kind of get ready for it and unload the car real quickly and get the stuff inside the church. We can do all of that. But when God decides to rain his judgment upon those who have chosen to violate him, then I want you to know that it's going to come pervasively everywhere on those people. They cannot get away from any of that. And when it comes, it's going to come suddenly. And when it comes suddenly, it's going to be dramatically when it occurs. Now, the big question is, when is that going to occur? Well, if I take you back to Romans, because we've been on this journey through Romans, it seems like I keep going through all these other sub-studies here. But at the beginning, we said that those who have now taken God and now they're worshiping creatures rather than God, and they are now committing great immoral sins, they are already experiencing the wrath of God. And the wrath of God will include such things as this, not necessarily a fireball that's going to hit them on the head, a meteor out of control or something. It's going to be God's still judgment. Whatever that might be, it'll be something they can't get away from. It will be suddenly, and it will destroy them ultimately. Now, that's if they don't know Christ as Savior. And so all of this is happening to those people, and that's how I take my refuge in the Lord. So now I read between the lines, and that tells me, okay, that means since God is large and in charge, I don't need to take up arms to be able to fight people that's up 
in government. That doesn't mean we as Christians got to go on a crusade against what we think is really wrong in a violent, man-made way. So now the question is, is how can we do that? Well, that's almost another sermon, but a simple answer is, here in the United States of America, we are allowed with free speech our right and power of our voice and vote to take advantage of these things. The critical thing is is that we need to know the foundations upon which we believe that we're going to take our stand and go whole hog to make our voice and then our vote heard properly. Now, at the end of all of that, listen carefully, I could let my voice and my vote count, but at the end of all of that, we still might not have righteousness reign through people, through government, through laws, but that still doesn't mean that we have failed. It means we did all that God wanted us to do. We partnered with him, but his still economy of kingdom work is being done in his timing because he is sovereign. We've just done our part. So I would say to Stan and Carol that if we don't let our voice and our vote be heard and count, then we have failed God, not in what the outcome might be, but in not doing due diligence where we are. So this important passage is so rich to us because we know that God is in control. But I don't want to end there. Go to verse 7. It says, For the Lord is righteous, and he loves righteousness. So perhaps it's not just my voice and my vote that counts, because there are a lot of people that can have a great voice and a great vote for the right values, but yet they're still living like those that have a different value system contrary to Scripture. So here he's now saying he is righteous, and he loves righteousness, or righteous deeds, as some translations will say. So it's not only the righteousness in our hearts, but also that we're going to do righteously. Then he says, the upright will behold his face. Now, I know I can't see the face of Jesus. The closest I can see of the face of Jesus probably will be when I plant my mind and my eyes into his word. And while I will not see an image of Jesus' eyes and nose and mouth, I will certainly know God's mind on paper. And in a sense, I will be able to hear God's voice on paper when I place my mind right here. So I'm seeing Jesus. But ultimately, my ultimate time of seeing Jesus is again, Psalm 73, 25, when I'm in heaven. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there's none upon earth I desire beside thee when I get to heaven. So the key is saying, you better be going to heaven. Otherwise, you ain't going to see him. So I need to trust Christ as my savior. Now, why am I giving you all that as a backdrop? Because I wanted to take you back to our country and why Christians, so those of you that are on the outside of this, why Christians are so committed to honesty, decency, and integrity and having the right kind of people in office with the right laws. And I have to do that by kind of taking you back in time just a little bit. One of the foundations of our country is really um, uh, emanating from that is going to be our freedom. You hear a lot about liberty and freedom, do you not? I think you do. And that becomes a very big trait. The bigger question, though, is if liberty and freedom, where does liberty and freedom come from? Well, that that is a good question. Well, I believe it really comes back to our founding fathers. Our founding fathers defined for us as a nation by laws what our freedom will be. They believe that a country that's going to have freedom, that it needs to be documented and it needs to be like a purpose statement. For us, it would be the Constitution. It'd be the Bill of Rights. It'd be the Declaration of Independence. It would be some other documents, similar but also crafted, describing for us what those freedoms would look like and what's the principle. Now, I hope you're following me because I'm building a case. This is not your normal three points on a poem and a hula message. In order for that to occur, for us to have those freedoms, those freedoms have to be delineated so we would know what they would look like and from where they would come. They were written now by men, and those men now had to be influenced So you have to ask the next question, who influenced those men? So if you take the framers of our Constitution and you go back to who actually influenced them, you'd have to go back to those who were their mentors, those books whom they have have uh, read so they would understand what was feeding their particular minds. You take that train of thought so they've embraced this this style of law, this style of government, watch this, this style style of moral code, where did all of that come from? Those men got it from others that helped influence them back in Europe that did that. So you take all of them and you find out what were they like 
And you will find that they then embraced what we will simply call the Judeo-Christian ethic. How many of you heard the term Judeo-Christian ethic? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Now, many people have heard that, but some of them have a difficult time. What does that mean, Judeo-Christian ethic? Well, I put it in your worship notes, and I, I know I may have oversimplified for some of you people that really like to parse all of this stuff, but I wanted to make it simple so that I could understand it, and maybe some others can too. Basically what that is saying is that there is a value system that is found upon Judea, which would mean the Old Testament principles and writings. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.